Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is on Christian education. This is lesson number nine in that series entitled The Church and Education. It's a lesson for November 28 of 2020, and I can just tell you I have looked through the last few lessons of this quarter and they are really worth looking at and studying very carefully. As usual, we like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we bow before you now, recognizing your presence and the presence of your holy angels guiding in our discussion and our thoughts as we study this very important material. May all those who listen be able to comprehend and understand and appreciate what you've had to say and what we can say on your behalf is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What is the role of the church in education? I will tell you that I grew up in a small Adventist community. It was almost exclusively Adventist, um, a, a little loop out from a small town in northern Idaho. And we had our own church and we had our own uh, school and that was, that was everything. We, you know, from the very first beginnings of the Christian church, when gatherings were in private homes and even the temple courtyard, think about that, in Jerusalem, the purpose of those church gatherings was to welcome, embrace, and educate new church members. It was a place where serious and relevant discussions could take place and people could grow in their knowledge of God. We're talking about serious discussions and we're talking about serious growth. Are we afraid to ask questions in church? Well, How do you think about that? You don't have the opportunity, except yeah. perhaps in Sabbath school. Which yeah. which, that's why it's Sabbath school. Yeah. That's I grew up in the same kind of thing you did in West Australia, and it's still there and still got the church and the church no. school, except it's improved. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah, my, my little church has grown, yeah. expanded, so forth. You know. This school is still doing good? Yeah. Well, they have now joined with another Adventist church, and there's a school that's lo a, a very nice school located about halfway between the two towns. And this church Promoting. supports the church. Yep. Yeah. That's good to hear. Yeah. Beautiful. So, now for something very serious for you to think about. Based on all of Scripture, a biblical definition of faith, now think of all that faith does for us, stated so well so many times by one of God's best modern friends, A. Graham Maxwell, is as follows. Jim? Faith is just a word we use to describe a relationship with God as with a person well known. The better we know him, the better the relationship may be. We cannot say will be because we remember the story of Lucifer. Faith implies an attitude toward God's of love, trust, and deepest admiration. It seems having enough conf it, it means having enough confidence in God based on the more than adequate evidence revealed to be willing to believe what he says as soon as we are sure he is the one saying it. To accept what he offers as soon as we are sure he is the one offering it, and to do what he wishes as soon as we are sure he is the one wishing it. Without reservation, for the rest of eternity. Anyone who has such faith would be perfectly safe to save. This is why faith is the only requirement for heaven. Faith also means, me, also means that like Abraham, that's in Genesis 18 uh, verses 22 and to 33, Job verses 42, 7 and 8, and Moses, Exodus 32, 5 to 14, Numbers 14, 11 to 25. God's friends, we know God well enough to reverently ask him why. Okay. So, okay. So I, I think you can understand now why I put that quotation in there. Reverently ask him why. Do we understand why we believe what we believe? I hope you really thought about and comprehended that definition of faith. It's the best definition of faith I have ever seen. 
And if you don't have a copy, you're more than welcome to go to our website at www.theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, and download this lesson and you'll find that definition of faith right there. And think about the implications. Reverently ask God why. And the, we're asking him why about what? About his character, about how he runs the universe, about his government, all of the above. Would it be fair to say why is there evil? Yes. And if the, a short answer would be 1 John 4.8, 1 John 4.16, God is love. love. That's why there is evil. Yeah. Because God give, without the freedom to make choices, you don't have love. Yeah. And God well, is love. Well, um, we have to also think that the evil is, death is going to die someday. Oh, yeah. So well, God so. will still be good, by the way. So that's important for us to very realize so. that. Very much so. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, God is love. Yeah. Yeah. Almost like irrational love. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sometimes you cannot it explain. Seems, it seems beyond comprehension. Right, there you are. Right, right. Yeah. God is just waiting for us to ask him all of the most important questions in the universe. Think about that. God is waiting for us to ask him the questions. People flock to Jesus to be healed, but they also flock to him because he did not speak as the scribes and Pharisees did. And of course you heard that, you hear that repeated many times in the Gospels. Well, he doesn't teach it like the scribes and Pharisees. He used simple stories to illustrate spiritual truths. So what should we be doing today? The church needs to be a place where genuine dialogue can take place, resulting in true education and leading people to a more genuine and deeper commitment to the truth. What do you think of that? Gary? Mm -hmm. Yes. God is just waiting for us. I hope I got the, the right. The story is told. Drop down a paragraph. Okay. All right. So it does start there. The story is told of a rabbi who, looking into the sleepy eyes of the young men who sat in his classroom, asked students, when does one know when the night is ended and the day has begun? Several of the students cautiously raised their hands. Rabbi, one asked, is it when you can tell the difference between a fig tree and an olive tree? No. Another student raised his hand. Rabbi, is it when you can tell the difference between a sheep and a goat? After listening to a host of answers, the rabbi answered, announced rather, students, one knows the night has ended and the day has begun when you can look at a face never before seen and recognize a stranger as a brother or sister. Until that moment, no matter how bright the day, it is still the night. It comes from the Sabbath wow. School Study Guide, Sunday, November 22. Very interesting. In other interesting words, he's talking. Interesting story. Huh? Interesting story. Boy, the real light is not just what comes from the sun. Real light is when you recognize truth, when you recognize love, when you recognize fellowship in the face of somebody else. And it's pretty good, pretty tough to do when you got to wear a mask. Yeah. I mean, you, you, the eyes doesn't tell you enough. But the yeah. facial expressions as a person yep. communicates is very important. And you see people that you think you think you know, but you're not sure because you can't you can't see enough of them. <laughs> it's a problem. Yeah. Are there any stories that immediately come to mind when you think of the way Jesus taught his disciples and followers, trying to help them overcome their natural prejudices and bigotries? Charles, sure. Luke 10, uh, 30 to thirty-seven. Beautiful story, and Ellen Watt says that it really, really happened. Yes. So, Jesus answered, There was once a man who was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, not the safest route to take. Not the safest route. <sighs> when robbers attacked him, stripped him, and beat him up, leaving him half dead. It so happened that a priest was going down that road, but when he saw the man, he walked on by, on by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite also came along, went over and looked at the man, and then walked on by on the other side. But a Samaritan who was traveling that way came upon the man 
and when he saw him, his heart was filled with pity. He went over to him, poured oil and wine on his wounds, and bandaged, bandaged them. Then he put them on his own animal and took him to an inn, where he took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave it to the innkeeper. I'm going to interrupt there for just a second. Sure. A silver coin, how much is that worth? <laughs> has to be good a bit. That was a day's wage for an average working man in those days. Yeah. So he handed that guy two full days' salary. Yeah. Take care of this man, he told the innkeeper. And when I come back this way, I will pay you whatever else you spend on him. And Jesus concluded, in your opinion, which one of these three acted like a neighbor towards the man attacked by robbers? The teacher of the law answered, the one who was kind to him. Jesus replied, you go then and do the same. I'm going to interrupt there while you've already finished the story from the Bible. It's going to yes. The lawyer wasn't even willing to mention the name Samaritan. Well, the one who was good to him. Amazing. Okay, we have some comments about on that story from Alan White, some very interesting comments. Diana? In the story of the Good Samaritan, Christ illustrates the nature of true religion. He shows that it consists not in systems, creeds, or rites, but in the performance of loving deeds, in bringing the greatest good to others in genuine good goodness. That's from Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 497. On page 499 it says, This was no imaginary scene, but an actual occurrence, which was known to be exactly as represented. The priest and the Levite who had passed by on the other side were in the company that listened to Christ's words. Okay, I'm going I'm to interrupt there for a second. I mean, you still have some important things to say, but I want you to think about this. Where did Jesus, where did the huge crowds gather to listen to Christ's words? We're told in several places. There's only one place where there was enough room. Sea of Galilee. He, he was in no, this is not Sea of Galilee. This is in Jerusalem. Oh, then probably in the courtyard. In the courtyard of the, of the temple. temple. And why were the priests there in the courtyard of the temple? Of course, this is their place to work. Yes. But why were, they, why were they listening to Jesus? They were trying to catch him, catch him. saying something that they could use against him. And then he tells this story about them. Turn the tables. <laughs> what, 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 how would you? How would you feel? I just uh, every time I think about that, I just it just. Mm. Yeah. It, it's sad. I mean, we shouldn't laugh, but it's such an incredible. Yeah. I mean, Jesus. Jesus didn't mention their names. He didn't yeah. point out anybody. He just told the story. Yeah. They knew who they were. But they did this all along, three and a half years, even yeah. to the very end, yep. they couldn't accuse him. Okay, Diana. The Levite was of the same tribe as was the wounded, bruised sufferer. And I'm going to interrupt again. What tribe was the priest of from? Levite. Always, from Levite. Yeah. So both of the people who passed him by what? were of the same tribe, not just Jews. They were of the same tribe Levite. as the man who got beaten up. All heaven watched as the Levite passed down the road to see if his heart would be touched with human woe. As he beheld the man, he was convicted of what he ought to do, but as it was not an agreeable duty, he wished he had not come that way at all, so that he need not have seen the man who was wounded and bruised, naked and perishing, and in want of help from his fellow man. He passed on his way, persuading himself that it was none of his business and that he had no need to trouble himself over the case. Claiming to be an expositor of the law, to be a minister in sacred things, yet he passed by on the other side. Wow. Review and Herald, January 1st, 1894. Do we and know? comparing that with Welfare Ministry, page 47. Yeah. You know, you can't help but think of how many YouTube videos or phone videos or whatever that you see today 
uh, especially in the riots, of someone needing help, yeah. and everyone just walks by. Yeah. Not, not and it came true. out in the two um, sheriff's officers that were killed this weekend. Not one person, they all videoed it, <coughs> yeah. but not one person came to their help. Yeah. They're all Levites. Pardon? They were all Levites. <laughs> yeah. For, fortunately, they, they were not killed. They, they were just shot. Yeah. Fortunately, they, they, they yes. were, they're, they're recovering. Yes. Yeah. But one of them, but that's... The, there were numerous well, people that calluses. videoed that. Well, they wanted to go to the, uh, the St. Elizabeth's Hospital down there. Uh, uh, yes, there's a whole lot of these people. Linda, that, Linda yeah. somewhere in that general area. And they and, blocked the entrances. Yeah, yeah. They, and they were they were swearing out that they uh, yeah. were demanding death for, the, for this the guy. They're hoping not, he died. Ed I mean, the hospital. They're, they're, hoping they're, the police died, they got shot. Yes. Yes. Well, they, really they were hoping that the. Oh police yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes, yes. yes. They yes. did get a bunch of police uh, toward the end that gave them the move, but it was a long time coming. It's uh, just nothing has changed, is what you read out of how, here. How far worse can things get? Oh. Yeah. Before the Lord comes, it's no, not a whole. Oh. It's not a whole lot different than it was in the days of Sodom. It was yeah. the it's violence, yes. no, and not. then as it was in the days of Noah, Matthew twenty four right. thirty seven. Yeah. As it was in the days of Noah, so it was violence. Anything that you have to force people, right. because they, in order to get them to knuckle under and uh, and do what you want them to do. Okay, the callousness. We, see, we see the withdrawing yeah. of the Lord. Yeah, one quick. There were four men involved in this story. Mm -hmm. To realize that three were Levites. Yes. The victim and the other sanctimonious too. Yes. And the one who was untouchable. Yes. Come to think. Yes, exactly. Untouchable. He is the hero not even realizing that he is yep. one. Beautiful story. And for, if you ever visit Loma Linda, if you haven't been here before, make sure you notice out between the School of Dentistry and the University Church is a statue representing this story. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, now let's think about us. Seventh-day Adventists have more light available to them, to us, than any other group in history. More light. I'm saying inspired records. We have unusual beliefs which are clearly supported in the Bible on our understanding of these truths. Just I'm mentioning some. The nature of man and the state of the dead, the Sabbath, 1844 in the judgment and the great controversy and all that it says about God just to mention a few of our unique beliefs. How good are we at introducing these ideas to friends and neighbors in a winsome way? What cultural and social biases are help holding us back? True Christianity must rise above these problems. The people uh, you meet on the street and the customers or patients or friends you meet each day are beings for whom Christ died. Think of the price he paid for them. So what are you, what are you willing to do to try to help them? I, I, I just have to interject. You know, uh, having been reared up, going to Adventist schools, um, we're talking about the nature of man, state of the dead, Sabbath, 1844, the great controversy. Really, truly, our pillars of our faith. Um, I've seen, I'm not sure about you folks, but they, there is a shift that we don't care anymore. Yeah. And that's sad. Right here, well, I probably should. 1844 being belittled and mm -hmm. by pastor. Mm -hmm. uh, who are we anymore? Are we a South Side club? Is this happening all over the world? Or is no. it peculiar in some places? We have to search our hearts. Wait till we persecution really comes to. and see what yes, happens. Yes, I was going to say there are areas, probably farming, out of farming areas, they tend to stick to basic living there are patches of people around it's not got real bad yet but it's not far off as we look about us in our world to, to build on what Charles and Carrie have just said it is obvious that things are not getting better no. light seems to be fading and darkness taking over so what should we do about all the darkness Jesus gave us some very clear instructions Matthew 5 14 to 16 
You are like light for the whole world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a bowl. Instead, he puts it on the lampstand where it gives light for everyone in the house. In the same way, your light must shine before people so that they will see the good things you do and praise you and your church, right? Your Father in Father heaven. heaven. Your Father in heaven. How do people look at the good things we do and praise God? How do we, how do we bring that about? I think, we, I think they do in certain areas. Maranatha is a good, a good one to see and see what happens in Africa. They are just so glad to get help. Yeah. Adventist World Radio is another one. Yes. 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 Yeah. How can we become better lights? Try to imagine yourself sitting on a hillside near the Sea of Galilee as Jesus addressed those words to his followers. There must have been a huge crowd. Uh, Ellen White again in Desire of Edges says, shortly after he began his ministry in Galilee, he couldn't meet anywhere in a town. There was no room for all the people. So he would go out of the town to find a, like a big amphitheater kind of a valley and he would, he, he would present his talks out there. What did darkness, do you think, meant to those people? They were living under Roman occupation in a militarized society. Romans were everywhere, threatening them with terrible death, maybe even crucifixion if they did not do what the Romans demanded. And yet, what did Jesus say? He was willing to call them lights. To be merciful, pure in heart, peacemakers, you remember the Beatitudes. How would that sound to someone living in the times of Jesus? What did they understand it to mean? I'll let you think about that. If we are true Christians, then we must start by being disciples of Jesus, and we'll be talking more about that later. Try to imagine yourself, along with other men and women, following Jesus every day as he was preaching and teaching and healing, and that's what he did all the time. One and a half years into his ministry, Jesus, that was about halfway, he returned to his hometown of Nazareth and was invited to speak in the synagogue. Jim? Luke 4, 16 to 24. Then Jesus went to Nazareth where he had brought up, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath he went as usual to the synagogue. He stood up to read the scriptures and was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has chosen me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the, uh, to the blind, to set free the oppressed, and announce that sometime, excuse me, that the time has come when the Lord will save his people. Jesus rolled up the scroll gave it back to the attendant and sat down. All the people in the synagogue had their eyes, eyes fixed on him. As he said to them, this passage of scripture has come true today as you heard it being read. Can I interrupt there for a second? What, the, the children of Israel clearly believed that this passage was a prediction of what? Messiah. The Messiah. Messiah. Yeah. the anointed one, the Christ who is going to come. And Jesus stood up, and if you read Ellen White again, she says often he would be asked, even as a young person, he was asked often to, to read the scriptures because he, he always, even the way he read the scriptures made it just come alive for the audience. So he would be asked to read the scriptures in church on a regular basis. Now he comes back to town, oh good, wonderful, preached to us. So he reads the scriptures and they said, oh, by the way, this scripture is being filled in front of your eyes right now. Hold on a minute. What does that mean? Jim? They were all well impressed with him and marveled at the eloquent words that he spoke. They said, isn't he the son of Joseph? He said to them, I am sure that you will quote this proverb to me Doctor, heal yourself. You will also tell me to do here in my hometown the things that you heard were done in Capernaum. I tell you this, Jesus added, prophets are never welcome in their own in their hometown. That's what Whoa. The Bible. And of course, what happened next? 
they tried to push tried him to off the push him off They the tried to take him up to the top of a hill. Very, I've been on top of that hill, and there's a whoosh, straight down. Wanted to throw him off. We have access to radio stuff in Nazareth today. I think of that often. Yep. It's not long they've got it. Well, Jesus must have been crowded by people asking for help almost all day long, every day. I've been in places where we have gone to rural areas and offered to provide health care uh, on a special occasion, and people line up before daybreak yeah. to be able to, to be seen. I mean, and we, you know, we can do, we're just simple human beings. We have a few medicines. Sometimes we run out of medicines even, and people lining up to get help. Jesus could heal anything, even demon possession, bring people back to life. I mean, how many people gathered to, to get his attention? Well, those who work in a service industry can imagine what that must have been like. And yet he never became impatient. He lived out the ideals of the kingdom. He was always forgiving, full of grace and love. The disciples realized that to be a disciple of Jesus is a lifelong commitment. Carrie? The Savior's commission to the disciples included all the believers. It includes all believers to the end of time. It is a fatal mistake to suppose that the work of saving souls depends alone on the ordained minister. Uh, can I interrupt for a second? Yeah. That sentence that you just read, I'm going to read it again, it is a fatal mistake to suppose that the work of saving souls depends alone on the minister. Yeah. The Sabbath School Quarterly chose to leave that sentence out. Isn't that something? Gosh. Wait, 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 say that again. If you look in the Quarterly, they quoted this passage. But they, and the, the sentence, it is a fatal mistake to suppose that the work of saving souls depends alone on the minister. They thought that was a little, so they left. It's an ellipse. That's why we are where we are. When I find ellipses, I go back and look at the original. It, that sounds like Ellen White. It's, it is it's, Ellen it's White. They left, the they, left, <laughs> they left out the punchline. Yes. Go ahead. All to whom the heavenly inspiration has come are put in trust with the gospel. All who receive the life of Christ are ordained to work for the salvation of their fellow men. For this work the church was established, and all who take upon themselves its sacred vows are thereby pledged to be co-workers with Christ. That comes from Desire of Ages, page 822, paragraph 2. Now, what in those that paragraph or two paragraphs there, what in that paragraph do we not want people to know? Nothing there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm reminded of Emilio Kennecke, you might know that name, I used to listen to his tapes all the time, but he used to say the work of a pastor is to baptize people, marry them and bury them. The <laughs> rest of the work is yours. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> really so very That's true right. though, so yeah. very true. Well, sadly, a pastor's job is not to push the envelope and really educate, he's to entertain and keep the, uh, the seats in the pews so that they will part with their uh, fire insurance premium. <laughs> oh, they call those offerings and, and so oh, tithes dear. and offerings. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Did I say something that was not true? Well, the, right. the work of the pastor, if you read Ellen White, is to educate the population, the members, to go out and work. That's the pastor. Amen. Job. And if COVID does not wake us up, what else is going to wake yeah. us up? I, th I think home churches are going to be probably all over the world. And what's the maintenance? Nothing. Yeah. What's the cost? The pastor's really salary. There you are. <laughs> you know, I don't think it's, pa I really truly really don't think it's too far yeah. that it's going to be. Many of the people in Jesus' day had to work hard to make a living, but somehow many of them found time to come, see, and hear Jesus heal and preach. Imagine that you are a fisherman. How many times do we, in the Bible, do you have a description saying, they fished all night and they caught how much? Nothing. Zero. Nothing. And you come home to your wife and your kids and say, no food. <laughs> Nothing today. Well, how about the little kid who had... Uh, yeah. Fish and, and uh, bread. Yeah. You see? I mean, so there were little kids who were coming also to hear him. Yeah. 
They were so enthralled. Even the kids were so enthralled by what he had to say, he didn't bother to eat his lunch. He was just busy listening to Jesus. Yeah. You know, uh, 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 Maxwell, I, I, l I like his style of writing. Uh, he, yes, he would sometimes use the words expiation, propitiation, but most always he had very simple ways. Yes. To, and Jesus, the, the master teacher, yep. his, uh, his message could be understood by little kids. Yep. Well, but somehow many of them found time to come see and hear Jesus heal and preach. And I, I, you know, I like to imagine these things in my mind. Maybe my mind is too over, overactive, I don't know, but imagine that little kid who gave his, his lunch to Andrew. He didn't know what he was doing. No. He, he gave his lunch to Andrew. <laughs> Andrew didn't he probably know. came home with more bread and oh, more fish yeah. than he went away with. Than he went away with, yeah. <laughs> and he said, Mom, look at, look this. at this! And Guess fed 5,000. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, he also fed 5,000 men, not counting women and children. Oh, boy. It just... Mm. Yeah. And those who became disciples of Jesus must have sensed a commitment to mission, a purpose, not just to survive, but also to really live as Jesus did following in his footsteps, ministering to those in need, sharing the good news of the gospel. Charles, can you tell us about Albert Einstein? Yeah, who else? Albert Einstein, often regarded as the father of modern physics, wrote, the important thing is not to stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existence. One cannot help but be, awe, but be in awe when he contemplates the mysteries of eternity, of life, of the marvelous structure of reality. It is enough if one tries merely to comprehend a little of this mystery every day. Never lose a holy curiosity. I'll add a sub school Bible study guide for Wednesday, November the 25th. Amen. Beautiful. Never. And Never then, lose a holy curiosity. We that, will be using our holy curiosity for the rest of eternity. That goes back to what you were asking about a while ago. When should we do this? How can we do this? The curiosity's got a big part of it. Yep. I don't find talking about certain scriptures here and there, but it's remarkable what you can do if you can weave it into a, a just a regular talk about history or something, yeah. and you can manipulate that any which way you want. But uh, I, uh, uh, I used to hear a lot of bad church arguments when I was a kid, and I, to this day, I just, but you can work it other ways. Yeah. Have a quick comment. Yeah. The, the greatest scientists were <coughs> believers. Yes. Down to the general. Yes. Yeah. Sir Isaac yes. Newton was yes. one of them. Yes. He yes. only got the 2300 days. He made a yeah, couple of errors, right. but he got it. Yes, sir. Yes. For yes. those who have had an opportunity to get a good education, it should be apparent that the more we learn, the more we realize how complex our world is. Yes. Scientists and researchers of all types are constantly seeking answers to even, or should, I should say, to ever more complex questions and issues. And what about Christians? What should we know about the search for truth and answers to our questions? Diana? Jeremiah 29, 13. You will seek me and you will find me because you will seek me with all of your heart. Amen. Matthew 7, 7. Ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Acts 17, 26 and 27. From the human being, he created all races on earth and made them live throughout the whole earth. He himself fixed beforehand the exact times and the limits of the places where they would live. He did this so that they would look for him and perhaps find him as they felt, as they felt about for him. And yet God is actually not far from any one of us. Mm. Psalms 25, 5, teach me to live according to your truth, for you are my God who saves me. I always trust in you. Teach me to live according to your truth, for you are my God who saves me. 
I always trust in you. And a couple more, John 16, 13. When, however, the Spirit comes, who reveals the truth about God, what does the Spirit do? Reveals the truth about God, he will lead you into all the truth. So if he's leading you to God and he's leading to all, all, into all the truth, where is all the truth? In God, right? Right. Well, he says, I am yeah. the truth. Yeah. The way, the, the way, the truth, and the and light. light. Yeah. He will not speak of his own author on his own authority, but he will speak of what he hears and will tell you of things to come. In other words, Jesus was constantly in contact with his Father. And then he, he, he poured out, he spoke out the words that the Father gave him when he was here as a human being. John 17, 17, dedicate them to yourself. He's talking about us. Jesus is praying about us. Dedicate you human beings to yourself, Father, by means of the truth, your word is truth. A careful look at the most outstanding people in the Old Testament and the New Testament will reveal that those who, those were people who did not hesitate to ask questions. Who did we mention back at the beginning of the lesson that asked really important questions? Abraham, Job, Moses. They were constantly seeking more and better answers. For example, look at the whole book of Habakkuk. We don't have time to talk about that now, but it's a whole dialogue. Habakkuk asks, answers, asks a question, and God answers. And Habakkuk, Habakkuk <laughs> asks another question, and God, look at it when you get a chance. But Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, He has set the right time for everything. He has given us a desire to know the future but never gives us the satisfaction of fully understanding what he does. In other words, what do you need to keep doing? Asking more questions. Yeah, but I, he, he also tells you, remember John 17, yeah. eternal life is to know the Father mm -hmm. and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. And the best place to start is with the Gospels. Yeah. And then read the rest of the Bible in light of what you learned from the Gospels. Yeah, and you got, it, you got everything you need up, up until that time. And you'll be light years ahead of, of the masses, sadly. Yeah. Well, Scripture deals with the fundamental existential questions, the questions about our very existence, which affect all of us. One, who are we? Two, why are we here? Three, how should we live for what happens when we die? Five, why do evil and suffering exist? Those are the existential questions. Christian education must deal with these questions satisfactorily, and only God has the answers. Therefore, Scripture must be our source. Jim? First Thessalonians 2, 6-8. We do not try to get praise from anyone either from you or, your, or from others, even though as apostles of Christ we could have made demands on you. But we were gentle when, excuse me, but we were gentle when we were with you, like a mother taking care of her children. Because of our love for you, we were ready to share with you not only the good news from God, but even our own lives. You were so dear to us. Boy, isn't that an expression of lack of self-centeredness. Yeah. Beautiful. Try to imagine what one of these small groups meeting in the city of Thessalonica was like with Paul leading out. So you have a small group meeting, and guess who's leading? Paul. <laughs> what would that be like? Mm. We've talked about Jesus, but even Paul. I mean, imagine a small study group, and here's Paul. Quoting by memory the entire Old Testament. Wow. They prayed, sang, celebrated the Lord's Supper, and struggled to better understand God and life, and they ate together. We do not know exactly what kind of schools were built up around Christian ideals, but certainly the small Christian groups must have been the place where the young people got their information. We can at least look in the Old Testament school of prophets. Yeah. They were not very rich people. Not at all. No, they, they lived on faith. Yeah. Carrie? Yes. I'm reading from Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world, 
but let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind. Then you will be able to know the will of God, what is good and is pleasing to him and is perfect. That comes from the Good News Bible. Don't these words suggest to you that Paul was concerned about what the young people were learning? Does that sound like something, you know, specifically, really specifically directed to young people? Communities are the settings for spreading the gospel. When we share with others and they share with us, we understand one another's struggles and pain, and we experience God's healing and seek to grow in our knowledge of God. But think of what the gospel promises, to, uh, promises us. Not only is it healing from our pains and hurts, but also it is a renewal in the image of Jesus Christ and an eternal home in the earth made new. Could there be any better news than that? But good news is to be shared. If you get some really good news, do you keep quiet about it? Not usually. <laughs> no. People are watching us. What do they see? What kind of witness are we? As we know, the Jews really believed that the Messiah was going to deliver them from Roman oppression. They had no idea that his main goal was to deliver, to deliver them from sin. Harry? I'm sorry, Charles. Christ disappointed the hope of worldly greatness. In the Sermon on the Mount, he sought to undo the work that had been wrought by false education and to give his hearers a right conception of his kingdom and of his own character. Yet, he did not make a direct attack on the errors of the people he saw the misery of the world on account of sin, yet he did not present before them a vivid delineation of their wretchedness. He taught them of something infinitely better than they had known. Without combating their idea of the kingdom of God, he told them the conditions of the entrance therein, leaving them to draw their own conclusions as to its nature. The truths he taught are no less important to us than to the multitude that followed him. We no less than they need to learn the foundation principles of the kingdom of God. Ellen White, Desire of Ages 299, paragraph 2. Amen. Yes, Robert Louis Stevenson was born in Edinburgh, Scotland in 1850. Stevenson recounts how one night, as his nanny was getting him ready to go to bed, he slipped over to the window and saw a captivating sight. It was a lamp lighter going from one gas lamp to the next. Takes me back to my childhood. <laughs> With childish delight, he called his nanny over to him and said, look at that man. He's punching holes in the darkness. <laughs> what role has God given you in bringing light and love to your community? If you are not sure, invite several church members to sit with you and discuss what you might accomplish together. At our Bible Sabbath School Bible uh, Quarterly Guide for Friday, November 27th. Very good. So how can we reach out to the people around us, our neighbors, our associates at work, and others? God has offered to partner with us in that task. So he just said, go, you're on your own. No, he, Jesus, what did Jesus say? I'm giving you the Holy Spirit to work with you. God has offered to partner with us in that task. Have you thought of the implications of having God as a partner? How can we address serious questions and get them answered? Our world is awash with information overload, much of which is not true. And what is it now? They say every two or three years, the amount of information doubles, something like that that's available, technically. Unbelievable. Much of which, unfortunately, is not true. I can remember when I was a freshman medical student here at Loma Linda, our this dean of the school got up and said, 
I'm sorry to tell you that probably half of what we're going to teach you is wrong, but we just don't know which half. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but he was right, though. Yes. Yeah. We need all the help we can get. How do we pick out what is right and what's wrong? And, of course, the only way is the guidance of God. And one of the oldest books is in the Bible, and the oldest book in the Bible, sure. by my thinking, and that is the book of Job. Yeah. And you got all these stories about all these friends of, of Job, and they're telling lies. But God doesn't tell you what the lies are. In Job 42, 7 and 8, which was quoted or pointed out earlier, you got to go through and pick it out. Pick it out. What were the, and that is called discernment, right? Mm -hmm. And if you can figure it out there, the truth is, then you can learn to read the Bible. But if you yep. can't figure out the book of Job, you're going to get thr be thrashed around for a long time and maybe never come to a conclusion. Somebody wrote a book, you probably know him, um, I'll tell you about it later, but anyway, he wrote a book about what God, uh, what God sh would really be like if he was a God. Yeah. <laughs> but he, he, sadly, he doesn't understand, he never realized that the true picture, that is the way God is, but he could, couldn't find it in, in Adventist or other, other teaching, yeah. Christian teaching. I'll tell you about it later. <laughs> Why is it that so many people who come to the Adventist church soon fade away and stop coming? Are they being socially accepted into the church? Yeah. Do they feel welcome? Not always. Is what your, about, what yeah. about la lack of logic in, yeah. the, in the message? Yeah. But, it, but you can go in some churches are, are very glad to see and other churches it's like there's ice on the floor if you don't watch you yeah. can slip <laughs> it's that cold well is your church full of small groups that associate together but do not reach out to anyone outside their group here I am folks I can see my friends but don't bother me with anybody else wow I'm very happy to say that we have a fabulous Sabbath school class that welcomes people. Of what value is it to have all the doctrines lined up correctly and even, even to be prepared to explain them if we do not treat those who come to our churches in a kind and accepting manner? Chase them away before they even, you even have a chance to talk to them. There's an ancient Indian proverb that says, <laughs> there's no point in giving a man a rose to smell after you cut off his nose. <laughs> All right. wow. we, <laughs> we have already said that the plan of salvation is the best news that anyone could have. Do we make it seem good to people attracted by what we say and what we do? Yes. If I may make a very quick comment. Um, our, our challenge is really to help people fall in love with the person of Jesus Christ. Yep. And if that happens, it does really truly does not matter. Mm -hmm. The folk will Okay. Yeah. And, uh, so that's our challenge, you know. It's not how many people were baptized or what. You know, really, truly to help them fall in love with the person of Jesus Christ. I have said on some occasions, you can measure the, how good a pastor is, not by the number of people he baptizes, but by the number of people who are brought into church by the people he baptizes. Amen. Mm -hmm. yes. I got, yes. I've got to yes. tell you this. I heard this at one boys worship at one of our colleges, I won't say where, and there's this elderly parson, he's about to retire. And so the, uh, the young new guy got up and he did his sermon and all that, and he asked the, the elderly parson if he'd take the benediction, and he said, yes, he said, dear Lord, I'm glad we've been here, but use the Holy Spirit to pick Pastor so-and-so's gap pricking with the Holy Spirit to prick the get the, let the gas out. <laughs> <laughs> that sums up. Oh, wow. <laughs> Why did Paul cast the demon out of that woman in Philippi? She had been not bothering him for a couple weeks already, but she kept saying, these men, pointing to Paul and Silas, are the service of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. I mean, isn't that a good message? Acts 16, 17. Unfortunately, even if it is the right message, but if it is given with the wrong spirit, it will drive people into Satan's camp rather than bring them to God. How often do people accept or leave the church 
based on how well they are treated by the church members. Exactly. We may be fortunate in having the best answers and explanations of Bible doctrines of any group, but do we taste people away by the way we treat them? What good is that? Diana? 1 Corinthians 12, 7-11. <clears throat> the Spirit's presence is shown in some way in each person for the good of all. The Spirit gives one person a message full of wisdom, while to another person the same Spirit gives a message full of knowledge. One and the same Spirit gives faith to one person, while to another person He gives the power to heal. The Spirit gives one person the power to work miracles, to another the gift of speaking God's message, and to yet another the ability to tell the difference between gifts that come from the Spirit and those that do not. To one person he gives the ability to speak in strange tongues, but to another he gives the ability to explain what is said. But it is one and the same Spirit who does all this. As he wishes, he gives a different gift to each person. And 1 Corinthians 12, the end of that chapter, verse 28 to 13, 1, in the church, God has put all in place. And the first place apostles, and the second place prophets, and the third place teachers. Then those who perform miracles, followed by those who are given the power to heal, to heal, or to help others, or to direct them, or to speak in strange tongues. They are not all apostles, or prophets, or teachers. Uh, not everyone has the power to work miracles, or to heal diseases, or to speak the strange, to speak in strange tongues, or explain what is said. Set your hearts then on the more important gifts. Best of all, however, is the following way. Now turning to chapter 13, I may be able to speak the language of human beings and even of angels, but if I have no love, my speech is no more than a noisy gong or a clanging bell. And you recognize that's the beginning of 1 Corinthians 13. Christians are supposed to be known for their love. Jim? John 13, 34 to 35. And now I give you a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you so that you may love one another. If you have love for one another, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. Good news Bible. You know, I'm sure that I, like many other people, probably read through that and say, yeah, God wants us to love each other. Uh, let's stop and look at that passage again. Really, look. Jesus says, first of all, love one another. And that, that's quite, a, quite evident in the Old Testament, uh, particularly in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, that it says that. But then he says, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. That's a whole nother level. And then he says, okay, if you, live at, if you love at that level, if you have that kind of love for one another, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. What does that mean? How many other people are there standing around who love like that? Uh, I wonder, it says a new commandment. Could be a, a prescription. Yeah. A, a prescription. It, it, it's, it's something you can still choose, not command you to do this. No, this is the way, you want eternal life, yeah. this is the, the, this is how to get it. it but you can choose to, Toss a prescription on your on your counter at home, and like I got did with when I got my uh, blood pressure prescription, <laughs> I didn't bother. I just tossed it. So, so what is a Christian? How many times were the early church followers of Jesus called Christians? Carrie, I'm reading from Acts 11, verses 19 to 26. Some of the believers who were scattered by the persecution which took place when Stephen was killed went as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message to Jews only. But other believers who were from Cyprus and Cyrene went to Antioch and proclaimed the message to Gentiles also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's power was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. They did a terrible thing. What did they do? They preached the message to Gentiles also. Yeah. <laughs> and we don't even know their names. This was a huge break in the, process, in, in the growth of the Christian church. We don't even know the names of the people who did it. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. The Lord's power was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. 
The news about this reached the church in Jerusalem, so they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw how God had blessed the people, he was glad and urged them all to be faithful and true to the Lord with all their hearts. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and many people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. When he found him, he took him to Antioch, and for a whole year the two met with the people of the church and taught a large group. It was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. And come this wasn't, yeah, go ahead. His Bible. This wasn't a compliment. No. In, back in the first days, uh, Christians, those are those crazy people who are yeah. following a dead man. Yeah. Well, the number of occurrences of the word Christian in the Bible is only three. Mm -hmm. Acts 11, 26, we just read. It's also in Acts 26, 28, when Paul is giving his defense, and then in 1 Peter 4, 16. So those early Christians, if they were not called Christians, what were they called? Disciples. And while it is easy for a person to self-designate himself as a Christian, you can wear something around your neck. To be a disciple means one is a hands-on learner and apprentice of Jesus Christ. Are we learning the skills necessary to spread the gospel to others around us? Are we making a life career of witnessing for Jesus? We need to understand very clearly that in order for the gospel message to get to the world, we need a lot of disciples. And Jesus did not intend for the disciple terminology to be only applied to his original group. Ananias, Tabitha, and, and Timothy were all called disciples, and they weren't part of that original group. Remember that Matthew 28, 19 says what? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Are we doing that? The church has been called a hospital for the spiritually hurting. Some people want the church to be a kind of university for those in ignorance and spiritual darkness. But a hospital and a university taken together would be a good place for disciples in the 21st century. Are we scholars in residence? Do we study our Bible seriously on a regular basis? Do, we, do our Sabbath school classes lead us to ask questions and to think of what we really believe? Has the church become a little boring? What can we do to once again make it alive? We may be very comfortable with our small group of friends in our church, but are we reaching out to others? Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, how can we be thankful enough for a lesson like this? Just to think of the calls that are, are coming out for what we need to do to represent your name, to become more and more like you so that others see you in us. We don't know what it really means to love as you loved. But help us to practice every day so we may get closer to that goal is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.